the first CD to go on sale in the good old US of A was... They don't have a CD buyer anymore. They're not going to buy these CDs and then stock them and make money only if they sell them. What is this world coming to? Broadcasting from Nashville, Tennessee. Offering a glimpse inside the music industry. Shedding light on things they don't want you to know. And exposing some of the industry's biggest secrets. You're listening to the Turned Up Podcast. Presented by Real Sound Productions. Here are your hosts, Jake Jones. That's right, you were one of the original Amoeba. And Robert Venable. Yeah, I remember that year. 1877. That was a good year. Welcome, Robert, to the Turned Up Podcast. Thank you, Jake. It's so good to be here. It's nice to have you this week. It's nice to be here every week. The weather is absolutely abhorrent outside. Googling abhorrent. <laughs> it's terrible. It's not great. I mean, the temperature is great. It's just kind of gloomy. It's great if you're an Eskimo. It's like 50 degrees out there. It was like 25 degrees last week, so get over it. But then it was 80, so I get it. I like the 80. I know. I'm from Texas and New Mexico, where it's a thousand degrees every day. The weather here in Nashville is very manic depressive, as it is wherever you're from. Say the city out loud now. Oh, yeah, I love that. The weather, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. That's what they say there. Yeah. Where you're from. We're so cheesy. <laughs> Pretty much just made myself get the little uh, the awkward shivers. I just freaked myself out. Like, like pee shivers. Like the, like the pee shivers. Oh, I just shivved myself. <laughs> Can't trust the fart, man. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to my next topic. What is your next topic? Robert Venable sitting across from me. He is well, he apparently is gassy. One of my <laughs> best friends. Uh, he's an award-winning producer, engineer, drummer for the band As We Ascend, as well as just an overall incredibly talented drummer. Uh, he's a multi-instrumentalist as he is really good at piano and singing and getting better than me at playing guitar. No, I'm not. I'm not at all. Um, the, I'm like, what, you just worked with 21 Pilots recently. Uh, can I still say that? I don't know if it recently works anymore. Right, it still it's like feels a, it's recent. It's been a year. It has been a year. Um, but 21 Pilots, Mute Math, Kelly Clarkson, Megadeth. Uh, DMX. All at the same time. The Rough Riders. It was like a choir. All at the same time. <laughs> Fun story, real quick. I first heard of Robert Venable in 2008. I was in a band in New Mexico called Third Morning Rise, and he was working with a guy named Rob Coates, and they were trying to get bands into their studio by telling everyone how awesome they were. And still so, do that. So Rob <laughs> Coates was like, hey, we just worked with a super group with guys from POD and Spoken and Pillar. And Disciple. And Disciple. Yeah. And, uh, and we just produced their thing, and we heard your music, and we really liked it, and we want to produce you too. And I ignored it. It was through MySpace. Oh yeah, that was that was the popular way to communicate those days. Yep, it was reminds me. I completely ignored it and was like, "This is totally spam." These big famous guys would never want to have anything to do with me. Little did I know that ten years later I would be sitting in my recording studio. Oh, ten years! Ten years! That was ten years ago. Hosting a, a number one iTunes podcast with your beautiful face, Aww. and you're dressed really cool today. I like your pants. Um, Dude, thank you. Uh, fun fact about Robert, though, that most people don't know unless you are are a part of a very, very, very niche market. Robert actually has a babysitting service for reborn dolls. So, <laughs> uh, so for uh, women, young ladies who may have had unfortunate miscarriages, they have these dolls. Um, that can help rehabilitate. Uh, they can be very, uh, very soothing. Um, so Robert offers a service to babysit those dolls uh, for these women. And it's actually really taking off. It's You've made a lot of money through Fiverr. I, I have. Um, for $5 a day, I will watch your precious baby, your loved one. Um, so right now I'm watching um, twins, uh, Nikki and Vicky. And uh, I've taken on a little bit more than I can handle by also um, taking on this one... I, ironically named Jake, Jacob, um, who I watch as well. And I feed them. Um, I bathe them. I change their diapers and do all the things that their mothers would, would, would want me to do while they're working um, or doing jazzercise. And uh, when they come pick them up, they are happy. They're thrilled. And sometimes I get a dollar tip. That is absolutely remarkable. Thank you, Jake. You are the salt of the earth. Um, I felt called to do that. Okay. Um, it was biblical. Um, funny thing, this, so my daughter has a reborn because she wanted a baby doll that looked real. <laughs> and apparently they have like silicone skin um, to make them feel more realistic. And they don't have really hard body parts like the hard plastic ones you'd find at the store. Um, it's just, they're creepy. 
Um, I think the hair on hers looks like Donald Trump, so I make her keep a hat on it when we go in public. Oh, it's absolutely terrifying. So the bad part is I don't like her taking it into stores or restaurants a lot of times because people, first of all, will see her carrying a baby and think, oh my gosh, this this kid is carrying around a baby all haphazardly. Um, but the bad part is um, in one of our vehicles, we don't have tinted windows. So if she just leaves it sitting in the car seat, we're scared to death that someone's going to break our car window open because we came out once and some lady said, we, we were just about to call the police saying there was a baby stuck in the backseat of your car with the windows up. Oh my gosh. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, we can't do this anymore. Uh, so it's one of those things where like, <laughs> if you leave it in the car, we cover it up with a jacket and put it, <laughs> make sure there's not a hand sticking out because <laughs> that's even worse. <laughs> oh man. But, now you just need someone to see you like covering Covering it. the baby. Like someone the- parks next to you and sees you covering your your baby with a blanket and, and I can't push it down far enough. It looks like I'm stay in the Just car, baby. Shove it under the seat. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't want anyone to steal it, you know? Oh, but they look realistic. If you're yeah, I, all the time, she gets comments like we thought that was, Oh my gosh, that was a real baby. I'm like, Oh yeah. Well she, she gets, she gets her thrills off of that. She loves that. Um, but in the meantime, we're like, Oh crap. I always thought, thought the baby kind of looked like Chucky a, a little bit like, like Chucky Trump. Chucky Trump. <laughs> That's a good combination. Yeah, it's actually the perfect combination. It, it does. It's kind of creepy. But in front of me, not as creepy as Chucky Trump is not the, quite close. Very close. Um, not not at all. Uh, one one of my best friends in the world, Jake Jones. Um, so if you don't know who Jake Jones is, get out of town. So you, Jake Jones, will play guitar and sing in the band as we ascend on this upcoming tour that's about to hit all sorts of cities across City the country. City Rock Fest tour. Yeah, with all sorts of cool bands. Um, if you don't know about that, you can check it out online at As We Ascend's uh, Facebook page um, or just hit us up and we'll shoot you dates on when the band is coming to a city near you. Man. Okay, so besides besides singing and playing guitar um, in this band, you also used to play in We As Human. And I see awards all over the walls in your studio, which is awesome. It's very rustic wood, like a very cool epitome of Nashville studio, yet not as pretentious and not as countryfied. <laughs> If that makes sense. <laughs> you need a banjo tar hanging on the wall. It, you need something like a banjo. Yeah, something around here. But it's cool. Um, and you have awards and accolades. Uh, top 10, number one, even charting Billboard songs that you... So do you. Thank you. Produced, co-written, uh, engineered, all sorts of stuff. Like, you're, you're just doing it all. You're living the life, Jake, and uh, making me jealous now. So before I get into the subject matter of today's podcast, I wanted to share with the world something that you have been very humble about. And you haven't really... You haven't had the ability or the platform to really talk a lot about this, but I want you to. Jake Jones, before you had your website all dedicated completely to music production, so when you went to jakejonesproductions.com, there were two choices you had. One, click here to enter the music production site. Or two, click here to Jake Jones, professional playing dead actor. And so you used to be called a lot of times to play dead. That's right. Um, Again, kind of along with the theme of our podcast, which is exposing the truth about the music industry, a little behind the scenes of film, uh, a lot of actors and actresses don't like to play dead. Like they don't want to do their stunts because it's dangerous. They don't want to be dead on screen. It's a a superstition really, because once you finally do play dead on screen, um, that can mean a lot of times you really do die. So I think everybody who's ever played dead will eventually die. I think that's, I, I honestly think that. It's 100% the truth. Um, and so because for that reason, a lot of actors and actresses call in a stunt double to play dead for them. Wow. And this is including breathing or not breathing? Or how, how do you breathe but not breathe? Well, I, I'm what's called a method actor. So I actually, uh, I die. Okay. Um, and didn't, then didn't see that coming. It, it makes, uh, it's more believable. I, I, I agree with that. I always watch um, when, when it's not you on there, I can tell when they hire somebody else who's not as good um, or they don't have the budget to hire a, a playing dead actor. And uh, they either laugh, like they're tickled somehow when they are picked up um, or that you can see them breathing. And it's plain as day. You can just see it if you're looking for it. So next time you watch a movie with someone dying, just look for that or look, look for Jake. Yeah, it's probably me. Um, the, uh, my last role, I was uh, filling in for Julia Roberts. Uh, the one before that, Kate Winslet. Um, so you do look a lot like Kate. Yeah, I don't um, see the Julia thing, but I mean, I, I they do a lot of cool things in Hollywood. I can see that. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, uh, you can you can uh, just watch any film where they die, and uh, and that's me. What are we talking about today? I mean, I mean, we're kind of talking about a few things, but really, I think the overarching theme is is kind of the death of 
tangible music media as we know it and also the rise of a new one but more importantly like the why so you're talking about cds like let's, let's talk about it like the elephant in the room like cds are disappearing well i mean i'm really sad about the uh the phonograms oh yeah right Th- those have been gone a long time so you've must been weeping for years yeah well especially to see one of your own inventions like that robert um, thank you Thank you. Yeah, it was one of those things. I actually co-worked on that with a French guy, but we'll talk about that in a second. I, I gave him all the credit because I didn't want to be that guy. Again, called by the Lord. Very <laughs> humble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should just jump in. We should, before we talk about the CDs disappearing and how Best Buy is pulling them from the shelves, if you didn't know that, newsflash, sorry for the spoiler, uh, but we should probably talk about how we even got to the CD, like the the birth and death of other audio media, um, I guess mediums, if you will, um, ways that that audio was captured and delivered into our ears over the years. So we can see if there's a pattern here and see what might be coming next, if that makes sense, see if we can see a trend. So I've had this pop up in conversation several times over the last couple of weeks uh, with the We Love Awards that we were just at. Uh, it came up because we were with other bands, other producers, a lot of music people were there. A lot of music people, label people, um, as yeah. well as just clients that I've spoken with. Even you and I have talked about it. So we posed this question to our fans of the podcast, and we asked, should CDs die? Yes or no? Yeah, and why? And why? And uh, and so we got so many really interesting answers. So we're going to read those. If you submitted uh, an answer, we're going to read all of them at the end of the podcast. All of them? All of them. There were a lot of them. We'll, try, were- we'll read most of them. <laughs> There were so many that we got. It, but my point being, uh, there was there was definitely an overarching theme through all of them. There was. And I was kind of surprised by it, actually, to be honest. When we get there, we'll we'll talk about it. Ooh, a little foreshadowing. We'll get there. I thought you were going to say foreshawing. A little foreshawing, the third member of As We Ascend. He's going to be here soon, getting we, ready for that tour. He's got to be on this podcast. So how did we get to CDs? Where, where did... Because CDs are definitely the most recent... They're the newest invention of tangible With physical mediums. Physical, yeah. Um, but it's I mean, a- unless you talk about like USB sticks, hey. which I mean, no, you're not going to Best Buy and buying a USB stick of an album. So right. I guess CDs. Yeah. CDs would be the most recent invention. Which, if you think about it, that's pr- they're pretty old. They've been around since the 80s. We'll yeah. get there. Let's start. Let's go back to the uh, 1850s first. So you were around. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot. It was a lot colder then because global warming hasn't taken over as much Okay, by that point. We didn't have as much hairspray going on yet okay. um, to kill the ozone layer. So 1857 is the year. Transport yourself back there. Okay. And uh, <laughs> that's it. The uh, Frenchman that I spoke of earlier, Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. I guess he lived in Martinville at the time. You said that so French-like. Oh, thank you. I don't think I did. Um, <laughs> and, and <laughs> invented something called the phon- phonograph. Um, which is spelled like autograph with P-H-O-N at the beginning of it. And uh, it basically was transcribed sound waves. Um, um, basically, it looks like a, like a line that was traced on smoke blackened paper, kind of like carbon paper, or glass that had kind of smoke etched onto them. The way it worked was it had a like a flexible membrane uh, made of parchment or some other kind of material a lot like that stretched over a, the small end of this thing that was looked like an open barrel, like a horn shape, right? So it had this membrane or this, um, this paper that vibrated with the sound waves. And on the other end of this small open-ended barrel that looked like a horn was a, another little tiny membrane um, which had a pig hair, a pig bristle fastened to it. And this pig bristle had ink on it or some carbon deposit on it by like a, like a candle or, or a flame which kind of blackened the tip and had this scrolling paper that went by it. So every time the sound vibrated the big membrane into the small membrane, made that little pig bristle write a little line or a little waveform. I just want a pig bristle. On this paper. Um, and so you could actually see the sound wave or some kind of representation of the sound wave on this scrolling piece of paper. Wow. So could they listen to it? Well, they didn't know that they could. And at the time, I guess the short answer would be No. They, they, they didn't know that they could recreate the sound that was captured. So they could see visibly what the sound was doing and kind of make, oh, this was the loud part of the song, or this is when the guy sneezed, or whatever it may be that, that, that was happening in the room. Yeah. Um, but they didn't know how to actually recreate that sound until April of 1877. 
Charles Cross realized that a phonograph recording could be converted back into sound by, well, basically tracing the small waveforms into a metal surface, um, and then like basically a, like a playable groove, like a record player, or like a record on a record player. So it would like engrave... Into metal, yeah. Into wow. The, um, using a stylus and diaphragm similar to the phonograph, but backwards, like to reverse it, putting it back into uh, the, the metal thing to... I guess had a needle, kind of like a record player. Maybe a pig bristle. Maybe another pig bristle, and would translate that back into sound, like reverse the process. Wow. Um, and so lots of these phonographs were recorded and saved over the years. And it's kind of funny that that before they realized they could replay it, a lot of those were taken to a laboratory in 2008 and were optically scanned. And just played back digitally, and you could hear all this stuff that was recorded in the 1850s oh. and 60s that no one's ever heard before. So a quick, a quick search online, we found what appears to be one of the earliest recordings, if not the earliest recording that we still have, of human voice. That's a little, that's kind of scary. It sounds like something from a, a horror film. So you might not have heard of the phonograph, but what about the phonograph? Ah. So before Charles Cross could get his idea out, uh, this little no-name guy, Mr. Thomas Edison. Never did anything. Never did anything. Um, he brought the world something called a phonograph. He just took the auto out of it. He took the auto out <laughs> of it and called it his own. Yeah, I remember that year. 1877. Yeah. What, that was a good year. It, but uh, what, what was the weather like that year? Do you Sunny. remember? So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All year. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I was in New York. Oh, gotcha. That's yeah. City that never sleeps. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It never has clouds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's. Uh, I've never lied ever. You're really old. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, 1877. It's actually trademarked 10 years later as the gramophone. Uh, and it used a thin sheet of tin foil wrapped around a hand cranked grooved metal cylinder. Yeah, it looked like a little toilet paper roll. Right. So, okay. So, side note: one of my uncles actually has one of these. And whoa, yes. And, and if it, you're trying to picture this, I mean, just think of the Grammys. It, Grammy is short for gramophone. So just right. think of what a, the Grammy looks like, and that's pretty much what the gramophone looked like. Kind of a little more crude, but yeah, that. So, uh, so yeah, so that was the phonograph, which became the gramophone trademarked after about seven years of research, um, at the Volta laboratory, Charles Sumner, Tainter, Alexander Graham Bell, never heard of him and, and Chester Bell. Uh, he was left out of the, um, the, the three name group there. Uh, they actually introduced wax as their recording medium and engraving. Which makes more sense than the foil, which, like you said, would be really easy to mess up. Um, this hardened wax would probably keep a little better. Keep and it away from the fire. <laughs> we could make candles or a record. <laughs> <laughs> so Thomas Edison uh, later, in something called the Edifone. I don't know how much he actually played into it or if they named it after him. I don't have the details on that, but I know that um, from 1896 to about 1915, uh, this was the primary way of getting your music delivered to you. It was a seven-inch wax cylinder, which they called records because they didn't have the flattened discs yet. And uh, so just picture this seven-inch long um, cylinder, which looked like, I guess, a little shorter than a paper towel roll, but a little bigger than um, toilet paper. And uh, it delivered two minutes of audio, a whopping two minutes. You couldn't even get through a modern song on that right now. You can get through some Beatles songs, I think. Yeah, probably. But Beatles weren't even around quite then yet. So you maybe get a little bit of a... Uh, maybe. Here's the beginning of Johnny Appleseed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so around turn of the century, 1901, uh, we took those cylinders and smashed them. So we had a 10-inch wax disc, a 12-inch wax disc a couple of years later in 1903, which were able to play three and four minute um, of audio, respectively. So we went from those 7-inch wax cylinders down to these 10 and 12-inch flattened cylinders, making them discs, essentially. Um, first to be played laterally. A few years after that, in 1909, 
Edison came out with the Amberol cylinder, went back to the cylinder. You know, it's kind of this war. What are we going to do? Discs, cylinders? Come on, make up your mind, dude. HD DVD, Blu-ray. CDs. What's what's better? What's happening? I don't know. It's like this big medium war going on. He came out with this cylinder again, which was able to spin faster at 160 RPM, which gave you four and a half minutes of audio. So now that's, that's beating out these these flatter discs so we're back to the cylinder again um but he know he already patented this but 10 years after that in 1919 those patents expired for the lateral cut discs um, which opened up the market to different manufacturers which kind of set the standard in the format wars so that was able for like for huge manufacturers to take this disc idea and said hey let's make discs the thing now that that patent's expired we're all going to make discs we're into discs discs is what it's going to be so that kind of ended that format war. So 1925, uh, the speed of the record was becoming standardized at a nominal value of 78 RPMs. That's where we get the term 78s. You got your old 78s? Yes. That, that goes back almost 100 years. So 1925, wow. they're spinning these discs at 78 RPMs. But that's not entirely true. It is, but it isn't. Because based off of what kind of electrical value um, or... or cycles are coming into your house whether it be 50 hertz or 60 hertz electricity um, that actually creates slight variations in the playback speed very very slight i'm talking like at 60 hertz you're at 78.26 rpms and at 50 hertz you're at 77.92 rpms so it might be a little higher pitched or a little lower pitched a little faster a little slower depending on what kind of electricity you have in your house when you're playing these uh these discs so i just had this thought could you imagine being the guy in charge of changing the song at a dinner party but darling you'll have to change it in three minutes no four and a half minutes well then go ahead put on your favorite song we can even dance for a moment oh time to change time to change the song (laughs) just play it from the top we all like this song so much goodness that's it's a little bit of a different no playlists weren't around (laughs) (laughs) yo drop that beat make me a mix cylinder (laughs) <laughs> Here it is. Did you make your your first girlfriend a mixed cylinder? Um, not my first one. I mean, they weren't around then, but eventually. Girlfriends or cylinders? Both. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You were one of the original amoeba. I, well, I was. During your brother the, and I were hanging out in the primordial soup. That's right. Um, soup. So, so now we're. It's time to to upgrade, right? We need a, we need a change. We need a change. Something needs to happen. These discs are cool and all, but. But, uh, you know, it's the industrial revolution, baby. We're, we're learning things. Things, 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 things are, are happening. Things are happening. So, uh, so let's jump to 1928. Um, <laughs> that's good. Thank you. A little scat, little time machine effect. All the same. Um, German British Blattner phone. It used a steel tape and was a reel to reel, um, type of magnetic tape. That makes sense. So kind of like the cassette tapes that I remember from when I was younger, but probably on a bigger scale and very a lot more crude than that. Um, but, but the Blattner phone probably contributed a lot to that, to that format, to the cassette tapes that we know um, oh. that you can still probably buy hipster bands on these days. <laughs> we should come out with a cassette tape. Um, <laughs> Let's do it. So they were incredibly distorted. Uh, and so they decided to add bias. What is bias? Okay, so that's something we probably shouldn't get into a lot of on this because that's a whole big thing getting really sciencey in your words, Jake. In 10 words or less. Um, it's basically <laughs> reversing. It's setting a standard. It's setting a zero point for where the noise level is in the sound. So for playback, it, ca- it cancels out that noise and starts playing back audio louder. It's hard to explain that in 10 words or less. Basically, it makes it less noisy, dang it. Right. Well, and, it, <laughs> and bias is something that pops up uh, in different aspects of musical equipment, even today, um, you know, tube amplifiers and that sort of thing. You have to bias your tubes. Um, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's you all about with, getting a cleaner sound. It, essentially, yes, it reverses a lot of the noise or sets up. It sets a stand. Yeah, 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 exactly. So shut up, Robert. Thank you to the Blattner phone for uh, also giving us the biasing technology to allow tapes to play cleanly. Uh, in 1939, one machine was found to make consistently better recordings than other identical models. Uh, they took it apart and saw that it was adding 
uh, AC bias to the tape. Which so, a lot of them weren't doing at that point, but that's, I guess, what, what the difference was between this one that was making clean recordings and all the rest of them that, but people were like, why is it so hissy? Essentially, it was a mag- it was a, an electrical mistake. It was something was going wrong. They screwed something up. Something was bad and was causing it to be super clean, which is awesome. Right. Uh, and that became the standard uh, even used today. So we're still using the same biasing technology that we came up with or that was come up with in the, the around the 20s 30s right well and even hitler used this type of machine to record his broadcasts his radio broadcasts that were supposedly live while he was actually in hiding so he would so hitler would be recording his voice which I'm, no one was doing at the time and broadcasting it because it sounds so clear because of this ac biasing and broadcasting it as if it were live oh here's hitler your leader Fearless leader uh, broadcasting from his palace when really he's in a whole other city hiding out. And this idea, yeah, this idea of being able to make clean recordings at all was so foreign to anyone and everyone that there was no way anyone even thought to suspect him of recording, of pre-recording his broadcast, um, which is just so interesting. Um, I know what happens after this. This guy named uh, Jack Mullen, who was actually enlisted in the U.S. Army uh, Signal Corps during World War II, was also an audio engineer and kind of a nerd like you and I. So he acquired two um, magnetophones, which one of the brands of recorders pretty much that we're talking about, um, and also 50 reels of um, IG Farben recording tape and shipped them to his house. So he's got these two recorders, a couple boxes of these reels of tape, and he spent a couple years trying to make them commercially available um, because he wanted to pitch it to Hollywood for film studios for using like magnetic tape for movie soundtrack recording. Okay, so... Um, by this point, they've already kind of synced sound. If you want to watch some interesting uh, drunk history episode on sync sound, there's a cool one with Walt <laughs> Disney. Um, but that that happened already. But they're trying to embed this to to use this magnetic tape um, in Hollywood. So, right, because up to this point, they are 100 percent two different things: the audio and the video, and even to play it back. Yeah, you and, look for that that two pop, and you have to line it up, and then yep. start it the exact same time, or else it's slightly off. But you didn't care because it's cool, it has sound at all. But this is they're trying to embed it in this tape anyway. So this guy, he gave a demonstration at MGM Studios in Hollywood in 1947, which actually ended up leading to a meeting with him and Bing Crosby, who saw the potential for the use in one of his radio shows. So Bing Crosby invested 50 grand, which is a lot of money now, but a lot, a lot of money then, um, in a local electronics company called Ampex. If you're in the music industry, you know that name. Oh, yeah. Um, to basically en- enable this guy Mullen to develop a commercially like uh, available production model of the tape recorder. So the cheaper reel-to-reel tape recorders were used for voice recording at home and in schools, um, and then Philips Compact Cassette, which was introduced in 1963, gradually took over. So it's kind of cool how Bing Crosby, the, the singer, the musician, the actor, this Hollywood star whose $50,000 investment kind of changed history. Oh yeah, forever. Well, and you can still step into any recording studio in Nashville and see a an Ampex uh, recorder, uh, you know, reel to reel set up. Yeah, and it's a huge brand, a huge brand in in tape recording. And the, I think they even made tape for a while. It's all sorts of stuff that anybody around Nashville, you see the word Ampex, you're like, ah, tape recording, analog, warmth, <laughs> hashtag stuff, <laughs> hashtag stuff. Uh, well, in the meantime, 1948, we have the LP record. We all know what that is. So they are 10 inch or 12 inch, 33 and a third RPM, 33.3. And these are the typical 12 inch records that you go by right now. You know, Ed Sheeran, if you want to buy his most recent album that's released, uh, it's going to be 33 and a third so RPM. When you hear people talking about vinyl, that's pretty much what they're referring to. But they weren't always made out of vinyl, they were made of shellac before that, and eventually vinyl because it's a, a hardier medium. Right. Uh, well, and they, uh, if I understand correctly, like uh, recording studios who cut to vinyl still will make shellac to press like the master, their master into. That makes sense. So yeah, Columbia publicly l- released 133 albums, including Beethoven symphonies uh, and Frank Sinatra performances. This is 1948. So that was the very first album on vinyl uh, release commercially were those 133 albums. So Beethoven and Sinatra and like probably you know, hundred and something other random symphonies and stuff. Yeah. That's um, cool. So 1949. Something new. The 45. The 45. Yeah. Um, so RCA was actually trying to beat out uh, Columbia with these, right? Columbia's got their 33 and a thirds. Uh, they just released these 133 albums. But 
those are 10 and 12 inches um, wide. And what about making them a little more portable and a little more hi-fi in a 7-inch compact uh, vinyl disc that's playing at 45 times per minute, like 45 RPM. And they make everybody buy a new player just to play your (laughs) album. (laughs) Or make those players adjustable so where you can adjust the speed from 33 to 45. Yeah, that one can do that. Yeah, Yeah, and most most of them after that point did, because, but it caused a new war. You know, it's always a medium war. What's going to be better, this or that? And so when RCA came out with this, their big selling point was, look, seven inches versus 10 or 12 inches. Uh, you can carry more with you. You can fit them in your pocket. I don't know if they fit them in your pocket or not, unless they had big pockets. <laughs> but it's a big pocket. at 45 RPMs, essentially, that's like if you think of a high-def television, like right? If you play 60 frames per minute or for 60 frames per second versus 30 frames per second, 60 is more hi-fi and rich, right? 60 is more than 30, so it's better. <laughs> so if you're spinning this record at 45 times around per minute instead of 33 and a third, you're actually hearing... Um, a a richer tone, more of an accurate representation of the waveform, which more hi-fi, I guess, is is easy way to say that. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, well, when they came out, they were first released in mono, which means, uh, like, when you listen to it, everything was just right in the middle. It's the best way I know how to describe it. So nothing was different from left and right. Right. You're playing through two speakers, it's the exact same signal, rather than you'll hear more tambourine on one side than the other. Right. And then uh, in the early 70s, they actually became stereo. And it's really cool uh, and kind of funny. Um, whenever you listen to a lot of these uh, late 60s, early 70s albums, they were just so stoked to have stereo, but they kind of just didn't know what to do with it. And so they like put all the drums in one ear. Oh, yeah. And all the guitar in the same ear. So we have drums and guitar in one ear and then like claps and, and singing in the other ear. And like, it's just so weird. It throws you off, especially if you're in a, a wider car or an SUV or a van where you have the speakers left and right. And you can hear, like, why is the tambourine way over there? Or why am I hearing nothing but tambourine in this side of the car? Whatever it is. Right. Which you have to think, when those, when those were made, there was not the ability to listen to stereo records in your car. Or, you know, people just didn't have head. Not everyone had headphones to right. listen. You know, it was like you had a stereo in your house. And it or, was actually a cool effect to hear the drums. Or they're playing back in a dance club or in a jukebox. Yeah, yeah. You know so what I mean? Sounded maybe just a little more realistic because the drums are separate from anyway. And well, fun fact about that: they also sometimes ended up recording drums um, two different times, two different drummers or the same drummer over overdubbing himself, playing a full kit all in your right ear and a full kit all in your left ear, playing the same thing to make the drums sound bigger. That's that is such a dumb idea to do with any instruments ever. <laughs> Who would ever do that? we do it with guitars every day jake every day that's just uh, (laughs) but drums that's tough though because you have so many instruments two hands and two feet and uh, they're really loud instruments and (laughs) you can't really hide behind other things right that they used to do that all the time wow oh that's crazy what was the first like album ever released on a 45 jake um i don't know 1949 um what was your favorite one uh, well, that was, again, that was a good 150 years before I was born. <laughs> uh, if I'm doing my math right. This was my, this was my favorite I math record. Good. <laughs> I math good. Uh, I, man, I just, I'll just tell I you, know, Jake. I don't know. Who was it? Pee Wee the Piccolo was the very first <laughs> release on um, these smaller, more durable discs that apparently were more hi-fi. Once upon a time in the land of music, there lived a happy orchestra. But the happiest instrument of all was Pee Wee, a little piccolo with eight buttons on his coat. And my, how those buttons could whistle. So they they searched the world over to debut (laughs) this amazing new technology. And RCA, in their their board meeting with all their fancy people, cigars and wine, were deciding, you know what we ought to do? We ought to put out Pee Wee the piccolo. You know, Pee Wee, he's really hot right now. People are going to love it. And that's what they put out. Wow, Pee Wee the Piccolo, my favorite. Um, well, 1962 uh, comes the very first consumer four track analog endless loop cartridge. The four track. The it's not the four eight track. track. That's the four track. A whopping quarter inch wide tape, three and three quarters inches per second. So three and a quarter. I wonder how long the endless loop cartridge was. I know it says endless loop, that's kind of misleading. Because if you just think of, I guess, like a cassette tape, 
it winds up one side and unwinds the other at the same time or wraps back around itself um, backwards. So you still have to rewind it or flip it over. Yeah. But th- that was able to actually be played a little bit more mobily, unlike the vinyl records. Um, so they're not skipping around as much. What happened in 1965, Robert? What do you remember from that year about this technology? It was twice as good as 1962 because instead of four tracks, we had dun, 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 the eight track endless loop cartridge. So if you've heard of an eight track player or an eight track, this is it. Um, it's a quarter inch wide tape, same as the uh, four track, same uh, amount of inches per second at three and three quarters. And Ford actually decided to put this in the car. The first, first like recorded medium put into like commercially released vehicles um, into their Mustang and Thunderbird. So prior to that, you had the radio or nothing. And yeah. now all of a sudden you had this whole, the birth of this idea of bring your music collection with you. You can play it in your car. Radio Shack has a super half price deal now on an 8-track car stereo tape player. Regularly $59.95. Now just $29.95. You save $30 and get your choice of music wherever you drive. Put stereo 8-track players in two cars for the regular price of one. Or buy one and have enough money left over for car speakers and your first tape. Get on the road to savings now with this sale-priced realistic 8-track car stereo tape player. Only at Radio Shack, a Tandy company. So that is going to conclude part one of CDs Are Dead, right? Make sure you come back and listen to part two next week. There was so much incredibly interesting and really cool stuff uh, that we just had to break this one up into two episodes. We do have all of your responses about whether or not the CD should live or die, as well as uh, just a a bunch of really interesting facts uh, regarding the rise and fall of CD sales and the digital age, digital media as it's taking over our lives and streaming, as well as the comeback of vinyl. So please, you really don't want to miss it. Come back next Monday, Turned Up Podcast, part two of CDs Are Dead, right? As always, hit us up on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Turned Up Podcast, as well as Facebook.com slash Turned Up Podcast. A huge thank you to Real Sound Productions for putting this together for us, for giving us this amazing platform. Thank you to my co-host, Robert. And as always, this is Nashville signing out. Peace. Thank you.